While they're leaving, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 8. If I just touch it instead of turning. Be a rebel.
Now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, now again, you would think if your sole purpose was to draw a crowd, you would tell them something pretty good and fresh, you know, God loves you, God cares for you, he has a plan for you, he has a purpose for you, you're special, that type of thing. But here's what he says. Verse 26. I'm sure his disciples, again, were waiting for something profound, and this was, but in a different way. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yes, in his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Well, let's stop right there. What? <laughs> Jesus, you're blowing it again here. Ho! Oh. Hold on. If you hate, unless you hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your spouse, your brother, your sisters, and yes, your own life, you can't be my disciple. Boy, that, that, I don't know about you, but if this was the first time you heard Jesus say that, would you be the one, first one to sign up? You've got to be willing to give up everything to follow me. Now, I'm sorry, but Jesus was good at not drawing a crowd, but driving them away. Over in John chapter 6, you don't have to turn there, write it down and look at it later. But John chapter 6 and verse 53, 1, it says that Jesus started telling the crowd, Most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and, will raise, and I will raise him up in the last days. And if you read on, it says this. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself his disciples complained about this, he, he, he goes on. Then it goes on and it says, Many of them walked away never to follow him again. Really? Surprise. You see, he wasn't about drawing crowds, but followers. So what we should be interested in as a body of Christ, as the body of Christ, is not just drawing a huge crowd. This is awesome. We have a full auditorium. But followers. People who are going to follow him no matter where he goes. Keep, uh, keep Luke chapter 14 marked there. We're going to come back. Turn it into the, the Genesis chapter 12. We're going to see somebody who did exactly that. He was asked to do exactly that. To leave his, his family. To leave everything behind and to go on a journey that God had called him to go on. And it was Abram. Later he changed his name to Abraham. But Genesis chapter 12, God gives him a promise. Genesis chapter 12 verse 1 says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country from your family. In other words, leave your family. And from your father's house. To a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. Here's the promises. To a land that I'm going to show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. Now, again, God tells him, leave your father's house. Leave your family. And so he's... It's kind of a test here. Are you going to, are you going to be willing to leave your family? Are you going to be willing to leave those you love? Leave everything behind. Now, I don't know about you, but if God spoke to you right now, would, he, would you and said, okay, walk out that door and you head down the road and you go until I say stop. Leave your family, leave everything behind and you just keep going. And it may be a mile, it may be a hundred miles, but you just keep going until you get to the place where I tell you to stop. How many of us would be willing to trust God that much to just walk out the door? It'd be hard. Would it? Not knowing if you'd ever see your family again, not knowing if you'd ever make it back. But he was asked to do that, and so he does. Turn over to chapter 15. God promises him, he promises him that he's going to make him a great nation. Verse chapter 15, verse 1. Now, some time has passed. Now, when, when uh, Abram leaves in chapter 12, verse 4, it says he, he departed from Haran. That, that word Haran means delay. So God delays on the promise that he gave him. And so some time passes, and Abraham gets a little discouraged. And so in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, 
Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Look, or said, Lord, good, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus? Then Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one is born in my house is not my heir. Now, what I want you to see is, is that later on, God, it says, brings him out. So the assumption is Abraham is in his tent. Now, he would have had a larger tent than this. But from our illustration today, Abraham, Abram was in his tent when this conversation takes place. Okay? So keep that in mind. And so what Abram is thinking is, all he can focus on is, I want a son. I want an heir. I want a son. He's not, he doesn't care about the promises that God has made. He's going to make him a great nation. He doesn't care about that. So Abram is in his tent having this conversation with God. All right? He says, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I, have, I go childless? And the heir of, the, of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. Then Abram said, look. So when he says, look, what's he saying? He's in his tent. So all he can see is what? What's in here? Right? And he says, God, look. Look at this. In other words, he's saying, look. God, will you look at this? Like God doesn't know what's in here. <laughs> all right? He's saying, look at what I have. You've not given me an heir. All I have is what I have. And Abram was limited by his little world. This was his world. He was stuck in it. And how many of us are stuck in our own little world? Think about that world. We're all in our tents. We all go through difficulties. We all go through these struggles. We have, we have the absence of our, Abraham, of our Isaac, of our heir. And we're in our own little world. And we say, God, look. Look at this. This is all that I have. And we can't see how he's gonna how he's gonna do it. Now, now go ahead and look. I'll try not to fall asleep in here. <laughs> Verse 4. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside. Everybody say outside. outside. Then he brought him outside. And said, look. Notice what he said to God. He said, look. So God brought him outside and said, now you look. Okay. He brought him outside and said, look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him as righteousness. We need to get out of our tents and get a different perspective on what God is able and can do and willing to do in our life. We've got to get out of our tent and look. He says, count the stars if you're able. He wasn't able. You see, that was the point. You can't count the stars. You can't imagine what God has in store for you. You can't imagine. And so he says, Abram, look. Now go back to... Luke. We all have we all have struggles, right? Nobody has struggles. <laughs> well, shoot, let's go on. <laughs> they took prayer requests out here one night. I just want to read a few of them in the teens. We don't know who they are, and that doesn't matter. But I just want to share some of these struggles. Just the teenagers are having today. Why won't, uh, why won't a family member that's a close family member talk with us anymore? Why does my brother do things he's not supposed to? Yeah, you're worried about them, not himself, right? Why is life so hard? It's sad that a teenager has to already say, why is life so hard? Is my sister doing good in heaven? How's my grandma doing? These are things we're asking God. Why did you make being a teenager so stressful? How come sin is so tempting? 
If you can save someone from dying, why don't you? They're saying, look, God, look. If I'm so unique, why do I feel like nothing sometimes? And on and on. I mean, there's just, just a long, long list. Here's, here's one that says, do the Cubs ever win the World Series? <laughs> <laughs> it, seriously, it says that. <laughs> but but we, we, we all have those absence of, of our Isaacs. And we do. We, we sit in our tents sometimes and we just, we're, we're so sheltered. We don't see, we can't see past our own little tents. And we don't know how God's going to do it. We can't see. Even Abraham, who left his family, a bold step that many of us would not take. He boldly did that. He got to a point where it was delayed. The answer was delayed. And he had this moment. Look, Lord. Now back to Luke 14. Jesus said again to the multitudes, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, and yes, his own life, also he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. You know, I heard someone say the other day, and it really was kind of convicting, they said, you know, if Jesus were the pastor of your church, most of us probably wouldn't go there. Because he would demand too much of us. I mean, if you hate, unless you hate your father and mother, unless you're willing to, you know, not, not to, he doesn't want us to hate them, he wants us to be willing to put them way, put God first, put him first, put his, his desires and his vision for us and his purpose and plan first. This is the last time you actually gave something and sacrificed something for somebody else for the kingdom of God. When's the last time you really, really made that sacrifice? When's the last time you lost sleep because you had to go help somebody because you, 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 you needed to do that? It's been late at night. Or when's the last time you got your last dollar out of your wallet to help somebody who really needed it? You've made a sacrifice for them. When's the last time? Jesus said this. He said in verse 28, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down First, and count the cost whether he has enough to finish it. Lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him. He says, how, how many of us would start building a house if we didn't finish it? First, we find out how much is it going to cost, what kind of materials we're going to need. Can we finish it? We wouldn't pour a foundation and just leave it set and say, well, okay, we're going to. You wouldn't tell everybody, hey, I'm going to build a house and then you lay a foundation and everybody would be like, Really? He goes on and he says, Say, this man began to build a house and was not able to finish it. Verse 31. Or what king going to war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, when you think about that for a moment, what, what king, what ruler would not consider, but before he goes to the war, can we win this thing? A builder, can we finish this thing? We wouldn't do that. If, if we didn't think we could finish it, if we didn't think we could win, we wouldn't start it. What Jesus is saying to the people he wants to follow is, don't follow me unless you're going to go to the end. He's saying, look, I'm going to walk out these doors. I'm going to walk down the road, Jesus is saying. I'm going to walk down the road. If you want to follow me, you've got to make sure before you do that, before you step out and follow me, make sure you're going to the very end. Make sure you're going to follow me. You're going to be a real follower. Not somebody who's just going to, when the tough gets going, when it gets tough out there, that you're just going to bail. That's what he's saying. You can't be like that. Because they're going to mock you. And they're going to say, that wasn't real. You weren't real follower. And so when Jesus begins to, and through his word in the Gospels, and he begins to tell us how we're supposed to follow him, see, the reason we wouldn't go to his church is because he's going to demand some things of us that we don't want. There's some things that, that, that this word says here that society doesn't want. And so they pick and choose what they want. And so I know for a fact they wouldn't go to the church where Jesus is. 
Don't shout me down when I'm preaching good. <laughs> Is that not the truth? Amen. And I, I'll be the first to say, I would be uneasy going to the church where Jesus passed. Because he's going to say some things that I probably would not do. I'll be honest with you. Then I'd be convicted for it, and I would confess it, and I'd try my best not to do it. But I'm just being honest. Because Jesus is saying, look, I'm, gonna, I'm going down this road, and I'm going to lay down my life in order to gain it. Are you willing to do that? Then he says, and he goes on in verse 34. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Just for a second. Let's say. This is, this is good salt. I'm just going to put a little bit on here. I'm going to get all over the place if I ever have a mess. There's some good, good salt right here. This is good salt. He says, if salt loses its flavor, it's not fit for the, the land. What would be good for the land for? Anybody know? Gives the nutrients and stuff. And it's not even good for the dung hill, because salt can be good for fertilizer. So he says, in other words, he's saying this, Jesus is saying this, if you are not willing to follow me wherever I go, and you're going to stop in the middle, you're like worthless salt, tasteless salt, bad salt that's lost its flavor. And salt that's lost its flavor is not even good for the land or the dung hill, which is what? What? Poop. Poop. <laughs> Crap. Here's, let's say this is tasteless, useless salt that's gone bad. Now let's say, let's say this salt. Here's why Jesus didn't care to draw a crowd. Let's say this is a good crowd that's, that's willing to follow. What if we took useless salt and mixed it with the regular salt? Does it do it any good? It ruins it. Right? It ruins it. And you know what Jesus is saying is, look, if, if you don't follow me and you're not sold out, you could you ruin crap. Let me know. 
And he was like, all right, I will. And he started walking off. He said, Holy Spirit just told him, give him that jacket. He's like, uh-uh. <laughs> and he knew he's supposed to give it to him. So he's like, all right. So he took it off and handed it to him. He said, here, try this on. It fit him. So he, gave, he said, it's yours, but here's my tie. He said, another time, he said he had his Lakers jacket on. Not, not Shaq and Lakers, but... Uh, he had his Lakers jacket on. He said, I'm a diehard Laker fan. And, so, and one of the staff members said, I, man, I like that jacket. He was like, yeah, I know it's my favorite jacket. He said, I was walking off. He said, the Holy Spirit said to me, give him that jacket. He's like, I don't want to give him that jacket. That's my Lakers jacket. He said, he, he, had, he gave it to him. He said, another time he, had, he said he had some crocodile shoes. He said, I paid lots of money for these shoes. He said, I, I saved my money for these shoes. He said, and, say, and I walked by somebody and, and they said, I claim those shoes. He's like, you claim them all you want. <laughs> These are my shoes. And he brought them down to get, he had actually had a brown pair and a black pair. And he had, brought them down to shine. And the guy claimed those shoes and he's like, I, I, I he said, I didn't get into that one. He said, I went to the hotel room. He said, I was like, uh-uh. He said, but when I got there, he said, I looked down and he said, I swear those shoes look cursed. So he said, I got to call him. So he called him. He says, all right. He said, the Holy Spirit told me I was supposed to give you these shoes. They're yours. And he's, ah. the guy on the other end was like, I knew those were my shoes. I knew they were my shoes. And then he said to him, he said, but don't worry about it. I have enough shoes, so I release you in the name of Jesus. You don't have to give me those shoes. And so he was like, yes, I don't have to give the shoes. But my point is, if, if you have that prompting, would you be willing to do that? Would you be willing to give the shirt off your back? Literally, if God, how many times has God in a still small voice speak to us a day and we just push it aside? Because we think, oh, that's silly. That's just me. What an impact could we make if we follow it moment by moment, day by day, step by step, wherever He leads us? What a journey that would be. Wouldn't it be awesome? It would be so cool to be actual followers and go wherever He tells us to go. If you'll stand up. Maybe you've never accepted Christ as your Savior today. Maybe you don't say, I'd invite you to come as we sing. We're just going to sing our theme song, Let It Rain. And if you just need some rain in your life and just want us to pray with you, just come on up and we'll have a prayer. That's what this time is for.
15, in chapter 15, verse 1, it says, he says to Abram, he says, do not be afraid. He says, I am your shield, and I am your exceedingly great reward. You don't need anything else if you have God. If he's your reward. Now, I, I, I tried this with Shanda. I, I, I went to her and I said, Shanda, I went to all of the, all of the jewelry stores, and I couldn't find anything that was as beautiful as you. So this Christmas, I'm giving you me. And she said, go back to the jewelry store. No, but seriously, what more can we ask for? That's what he's saying to Abraham. If you have an offspring, whether I meet that need or not, I am your reward. What best can we do? And you see, that is what he offers us, is him. And that's all he wants from us. Is it entirely us? We bow your heads. Lord, we just thank you. We just praise you that you are our greatest reward. And as Ronald said, you've made the greatest sacrifice. And as we leave here, I just pray, God, that you would just lead us, guide us. Let us not follow you unless we are going to go all the way. Lord, let us just not even attempt. If we're not going to be so bad. Lord, I know you want each one of us to hear your desires for every one of us to follow. And Lord, as we do, we just pray, God, that you touch our hearts. Be with us. Guide us and lead us through us. Let us feel those promptings a little bit more magnified that we would know it's you without a doubt. We pray in Jesus.